Previously on The Wood Whisperer. I'm a good. How can I survive with all these disorganized clothes? I can help you. My hero. As you might recall, we previously erected all of the large cases on the two main walls, and now we're turning our attention to the shallow alcove, which will fit with a chest of drawers and an upper cabinet with doors. I'll start with the chest of drawers first. Of course, that means cutting more plywood on the floor, which I found is a bit of a trigger for some people. So check this one out. I call this the downward facing dork. While we're looking at this sweet, redundant plywood footage, I'm gonna tell you something pretty cool. Did you know that this week marks the 17th year of the Wood Whisperer? 17 years, folks, that's nuckin' futs. So if you look at me and you think, boy, that guy sure got old, well, consider that a 10-year-old that started watching me from the beginning would now be 27 years old with a family and a career. That's crazy. Anyway, thanks for the support all of these years. I'm super lucky to have this privilege of making videos for you and I never take that for granted. All right, is this guy done cutting plywood yet? Jeez. With the parts cut to size, I'll get ready for some rabbits and dados in the top and bottom of the cabinet. I'm gonna do a test cut to make sure that the amount of material left over after the cut is exactly a half inch. Let me explain why. Now most of the time when we cut a rabbit, we will typically size the rabbit so that if this is a three quarter inch workpiece, this little rabbit here would be a quarter inch deep, right? So all we'd have to do is make the test cuts and make that one quarter inch. Whatever the material is after that is usually not that big of a deal. But if you have something that is in a fixed position, you absolutely need it to be a particular final dimension from top to bottom, this can land you in trouble. So we make a quarter inch rabbit here, a quarter inch rabbit there, because plywood is less than three quarters of an inch thick and we don't know exactly what it is, it can actually be pretty tricky to cut this piece, which now has to go between those pieces so that when it's all pressed together, we have a fixed distance. Now let's call that distance 10 inches. It's just arbitrary at this point. So to get that 10 inches, the easier way to do this is to not measure the rabbit itself, the depth of that rabbit. I like to measure the leftover material. So I make my cuts until I have a little tab there that's exactly a half inch. Now this measurement, I don't know what that is. I also don't care what that is because now if I want a 10 inch final and I got a half inch here and a half inch here, I know that this workpiece gets to be cut to nine inches and I know that I have a total top to bottom length here of 10 inches. So that's why we're sizing this instead of sizing the rabbit depth. So with that setting, leaving us with a half inch, we can make all of our rabbit and dado cuts. And since the saw sometimes leaves a less than perfect dado bottom, I'll clean it up with my router plane. Next, we need to cut a small rabbit on the back of each piece for our quarter inch back panel. While this might look like an ad, I assure you it's not. These Jessam hold down hoochies are just fantastic for applying downward pressure right near the finger remover, and I like them a lot. I like it a lot. When I size my dados, I make them just a little bit snug to account for the fact that each adjoining piece still needs to be sanded. And after the sanding, we should have a nice snug fit. So let's talk a little bit about the assembly strategy here because this is going to be different than what I did in the rest of this build with these very large cabinet pieces. This is a little different. They're smaller cabinets. This is a little bit more like I might construct a standard standalone cabinet that's even not a built-in. So that's why we're using rabbits and dados here. But how are we going to actually do the final assembly? Well, I am gonna use screws, probably gonna use glue, but the strategy is going to be drilling from the side that we can see. So if we have like a, a dado here, I wouldn't wanna to have to worry about laying out on the other face and then drilling from that side because you know there's easier ways to do it. If we just drill in from this dado surface here, we can get a perfectly centered hole and then just kind of countersink from the other side. So let me show you the tools I'm gonna to be using for this. First, we're just gonna use a standard bit to plow the hole through. That bit is a little bit wider than you might normally use because I wanna have enough room for the screw to kind of float in this piece. I want it to bite into the adjoining piece. 
This is going to be the countersink we're gonna use. I actually love this thing. This Amana countersink allows you to go a particular distance. It gives you a countersunk hole so that your tapered headed screw will sit down and go nice and flush. So we'll just use a combination of these things and get all of these holes prepped. From the inside of the rabbits and dados, I can line up the bit by eye and drill straight through into some sacrificial material that helps limit tear out. Then I could flip it over and I have the perfect locations for the three screws. Now I can easily countersink each hole and they're located right where they need to be. Time to assemble. I'll add one divider at a time using clamping squares to keep things square. Then I simply pop in the screws. I took the time to cut my parts for the upper cabinet as well, which is what I'm assembling now. Come on, Lou. The lower chest of drawers is assembled the same way. So we also accept payment in Flint Hill Pies. Yeah. I'm better at it when I like doing it. That's what she said. Or he said. So now we'll switch gears and cut some solid stock for the face frames. Remember that these cabinets will be set into an alcove and I hope to scribe the face frame styles right on site. So I'm basically going to glue on everything that I can here at the shop and leave off the oversized styles for later. Okay, let's make some drawers. I have most of this sketched out digitally, but I need to check my actual numbers against the plan and make any adjustments. My openings are about 1 32nd of an inch different, but I think that's well within the tolerance of the hardware, so I'll just cut both of my sets of drawers to the same exact dimensions. For the drawer stock, I picked up some basic half-inch birch ply. Turns out, this stuff was complete garbage. After cutting up all of my drawer parts, I started to notice some delamination and quickly glued those pieces back together. But then I realized the whole batch was complete shit. So I picked up some half inch Baltic birch, which cost about a million dollars and it was twisted. But at least after cutting it up into drawer sized parts, they were flat enough. So I cut all the parts again. The drawers will be rabbited and reinforced with brads later, a lot like our cases, so nothing too tricky here with the setup. Because I'm installing under mount slides, the drawer backs receive two small notches. And now we'll make two cuts on each piece to create a groove for the drawer bottoms. The first cut locates the groove, and once they're all run through the saw, I move the fence so that we have a perfect fit for the plywood bottom, and then run them all through again. With the drawer dry assembled, I can measure for the bottom panels and cut them to size. A quick test assembly just to make sure everything fits and now I can sand all the parts. Let's go! Plug it in! Look, I fully admit that working with me is no picnic. Oh, and look at that. Is he using backside sandpaper? 
<laughs> this is my backside, but this is backside sandpaper. It's double-sided sandpaper made right here in the Wood Whisperer shop. Grit on two sides means no folding and no frayed edges. You can get right into those intricate details and when the edge is spent, a quick cut with scissors and you're back in action. These are also great for sanding inside and outside curves as well as complex profiles. Because of the two-sided structure, the paper is also incredibly durable and the grit lasts a long time. So if you want to check this stuff out, go to Backside Sandpaper com. Thanks for your support. The drawers all get a nice eighth inch round over, which gets sanded smooth. By the way, I sanded all of the edges for all of these drawers using that single piece of backside sandpaper. The stuff lasts a long time. Time for some assembly. I don't think they can see it. Well, hello there! Oh, he heard us. Where have you been? Help me. I need Oreo, Oreo help. help holding these in place. Hold it up right about there. Let's get that one too. Come on. Snug it up. Can I put them in? Go ahead. There you go. There you go. It's my cat in a box. I'm gonna get that glue out of here. Oh, that's perfect. This one came out dead on. Corner clamps are now my new favorite way to glue up rabbited drawers. No more crisscrossing clamps or resulting gaps. This was Jay's idea, so thanks, Jay. Sanding the inside corners where the glue was cleaned up is a breeze with backside sandpaper. The outsides are then cleaned up with some sanding as well. And look at that, we got some drawers. Now I can attach the locking mechanisms to the underside of the drawers. To attach the slides themselves, I usually space them back about an eighth of an inch from the front. And while that's easy to do on the inside slides, it's going to be a lot harder on the outsides where I have no face frame yet. So instead, I'll use a little spacer that I can clamp to the back. And to locate the slides vertically, I use a scrap piece of three quarter inch ply cut to the right length. After I install all four at that height, I could then cut that piece down so that it becomes a spacer for the next set of slides. I then repeat this process, working my way down. Now somewhere along the lines, I mismeasured and that bottom gap isn't right. I'll save you the horror of watching me remove the slides and redo a few rows to adjust my gaps so that they're more even, but here's the result. Now I'll measure and cut the back panel. A little glue around the rabbit and along the center divider and we can drop in the panel. Now I noticed that the cabinet is just a little bit out of square, so I convince it that it wants to be square with a clamp and then pop in the back. Everything is secured with brad nails. So now I'm going to pick out some material for my drawer fronts. Really weird that I have to purchase lumber from myself, but whatever. I actually have some nicely figured cherry that I'm more than happy to use. It's for Nicole after all, but I was a little unsure about making such a bold statement with so many figured drawer fronts. So I asked Nicole what she wanted and she said, give me the fancy stuff. When I told her that some people might disagree with that decision, she said, So what? Who cares? Because this stuff is highly figured, you really have to watch out for tear out with the power tools. Running at a slow speed with a helical head planer is definitely the way to go if you have the means. A drum sander would be another good option. Now I can cut the drawer fronts to final width and length. and pre-drill for the pulls. These holes are the key to an easy and perfect drawer front installation and you'll see why in a minute. The fronts look good straight out of my planer, but they could look a little bit better. A scrape with a card scraper cleans up the surface nicely and I finish it off with some 220 grit sanding.
As an alternative, you can also smooth the surface with a hand plane, but this heavy figure really requires you to have a good high angle and a very sharp iron. And when you have some burnt edges like these, there's really no better way to clean that up than with a nice smoothing plane. Of course, round over. And some backside sandpaper. Now is a great time to finish the drawer fronts prior to attaching them. I'm using Osmo's 2K oil for this since that's what I already used on the rest of the cabinet. And don't forget to check out my hard wax oil comparison video that I did a few months back if you're trying to wade through the many options available today. Now watch this dummy proof installation. Using spacers, I can get these fronts located perfectly and firmly attached, resulting in drawers that require absolutely no adjustment after the fact. The bottom spacer is a half inch thick and I put an eighth inch spacer between the fronts. From there, I can drive a couple of screws through the pull holes and into the drawer box as a temporary but firm attachment. Now I'll add another eighth inch spacer to set the next row and attach those with screws. Bless you. and so on and so forth. <laughs> Uh-oh, here comes the inspector. Ooh. Very nice. Flamey. Oh, it's flamey. <laughs> It's real, real flaming. I love it. So with the drawers removed and the fronts clamped in place for extra security, I can countersink for more permanent screws from the inside. With those screws in place, I can now remove the temporary screws, drill completely through, and attach the hardware. So easy, even a Spagnolo can do it. Now let's take everything to the house. Moment of truth. Will it fit? Oh mama. <laughs> okay, settle down. With my celebration dance over, you're welcome by the way, I can attach the cabinet to the base and the wall. And now I write a secret love note that no one will ever know about. The style scribing will be much like we did for the larger cabinets. The style is oversized and I use a spacer so that I could butt the piece in a known quantity and then I could take the scribe at that same known quantity and mark the shape of the wall. I cut it rough at the bandsaw and then fine tune with a block plane. I'll use some of that type on quick and thick for the glue and pop in some brad nails. The process will be repeated on the right side. And time to apply some finish. I should probably clean up a bit first. Because the inside of this cabinet will never be seen, there's really no reason to finish it. Furthermore, the smell would linger for a very long time and would stink up any clothes that are stored in those drawers. So the only parts receiving finish are the visible ones. All right, let's see those drawers.
All right, time for a safe talk. You see the drawer right here? Keen eyes will notice that it doesn't quite have the same figure as the rest, though it does have the sapwood pattern that I wanted. I'm super limited in material for this, so this was the best that I could find at the time, but I really wanted to match a little bit better, so I went back to the shop, I dug through the scrap and my entire wood pile, and tried to find a new candidate for the front. Now this one has some more figure, that's good, but it doesn't have the sapwood or the color, and unfortunately it's just too light. So unfortunately, the old front had to go back on and I guess it was worth a shot. Now I can install the toe kick board and finish up the baseboard trim. Back at the shop, I can move on to the upper cabinet, which is now ready for doors. For those of you that install doors and hardware like this routinely, I'm sure this is just second nature, but for me, I have to really map out everything to ensure that I don't make any mistakes. So I actually make up a sample piece so that I can look at the overlay and the clearance needed for the swing of the door. That helps me dial in my final door width and spacing so that I'm all but guaranteed not to have to make a return trip home to finesse the doors, I hope. So now we have some nice frame and panel doors to make, sort of reminiscent of the mission style. It's the end of the day at this point, and I'm not going to be able to finish the doors, so I mill them slightly oversized, just leaving some extra meat just in case it moves overnight. I could always fix them in the morning. And the next day, I do see some movement, so I'll rejoint and plane to thickness and width. The parts are then cut to final length at the miter saw. And here's what I'm going for. Each door will have three panels. I'm making my life easier by using domino joinery here, so I carefully mark out my domino locations on every piece. And I'll be using 8x40s on this one. With the mortises cut, I'll sand some dominoes down so that I can do a couple of quick dry assemblies. Otherwise, they fit a little bit too tight. Oh yeah, that's looking nice. Sometimes, in a real working shop, things don't always happen in a good storytelling order, so it's at this point that I decided to drill my shelf pin holes in the upper case. We also cut and finish the back panel and the inside of the case, and then attach that back panel. You know, come here and give me a kiss. He says, no, no thanks, you're gross. Next, I'll mill up some stock for the face frame, once again attaching everything but the outside styles and the outer rails. As always, spacers are your friends.
These top horns will never be seen and they'll be covered up by the crown molding, so I just trim off the excess. Now we head back to the house to hang the upper case. Anytime I hang a cabinet, I like to employ a wall cleat if possible. I'm often working alone or with minimal assistance, so it's awfully nice to have something that you can set the cabinet on top of to take the weight while also keeping the cabinet level and at the correct height. And because there's no reason a cleat can't be permanent and decorative, I'm leaving this one right there. Booty cam, booty 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 cam, booty cam. I'll tell you, every time I do something like this, I am always super nervous that it's not gonna fit. I imagine if you do enough of them, you become numb to the experience. Now, I'll scribe the styles, cut at the bandsaw, finesse, and install. Oh yeah! With the outer styles in place, I can now cut the remaining rails to size and install. At this point, there's a little unevenness between the face frame pieces, so I'll sand everything nice and smooth. And when I break the edges with backside sandpaper, I'll use the vac at the same time to limit the amount of dust getting into Nicole's clothes that already inhabit the closet. Now for some finish on the face frame. Back at the shop, I cut some plugs for that permanent wall cleat and install those with glue. I'll trim them flush and sand and then finish again later on. Do the deed. Now back to those doors that we were working on. The reason I paused on them previously was because I wasn't 100% sure about my door height and wanted to get the case and face frame completely in place before making the final call. Well, good thing I did because they're now just about an inch too long. So we've got some fixing to do. It's easiest to remove the stock from the bottom of the door. So I'll cut an inch off the styles and the lower divider. I plug the mortises with some dominoes wherever possible and then trim off the excess and cut them to final length at the miter saw. By the way, I need to explain why this cut is safe. Normally, you don't want an off cut locked between the blade and a stop, but what'll make this piece kick back is contact with the teeth. The plate of the blade is smooth and generally won't cause kickback. So notice what I'm doing here. I take my time with the cut until I'm near the end. At that point, I quickly push the saw all the way through and then release the trigger. I keep the head down with the teeth inside the table until the blade stops completely. Only then do I lift the saw and then retrieve the off cut. And now I can recut the domino mortises as needed. Okay, so with that out of the way, we can start making up some door panels. To match the theme set by the fancy drawer fronts, I find some decent figured and sappy stock for the panels. And because my stock is three quarters of an inch in thickness, I should be able to get a book matched set for each door with a quick resaw at the bandsaw. After cutting the final size, each panel is given a thorough sanding. Because the grooves could be a little bit tricky to locate, I use a pencil to mark the surfaces that will receive the grooves as well as the start and stop points. I'll cut the grooves at the router table so that I can do that start and stop as needed. Now the lines I have here show the ends of the adjoining work pieces, so I need my groove to go in about a quarter inch beyond that point to house the panel. And with those marks transferred to the face, I could then use the marks on my insert to decide where to plunge and where to lift. 
So interesting thing here, it's super important to maintain awareness and never go on autopilot when you're in the shop. After a few cuts, it started to look as if my bit was sitting slightly higher. I actually thought it was my imagination and then I double checked and it was. The operation here causes a lot of vibration and I guess my collet just loosened up just enough to let the bit start to slip. Now if I didn't notice it, it would have eventually come all the way out, ruining my workpiece, damaging the bit and possibly injuring me. I think I may have just got lucky this time. So I cleaned the collet and then gave it a little extra zhuzh to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Even then, I'll be paying close attention to the bit height after every single cut. To test the fit of the panels, I'll use a plane to round over the corners slightly. That should give the panels just a little bit of wiggle room to allow for expansion and contraction. We're getting into the drier part of the year, so I'm planning mostly for expansion. People often wonder about the order of operations when it comes to things like a simple frame and panel door. And for me, I try to do everything that I can prior to glue up. So things like the inside edges are fully smoothed prior to assembly. You just need to be careful not to knock the edge out of flat, especially in those joinery areas. I also like to route my roundovers on the inside edges wherever possible, being careful to stop where the adjoining pieces meet. For the assembly, I want a little extra working time, so I'm using Type Bond's liquid hide glue. This stuff gives me the working time of epoxy without having to deal with epoxy, and cleanup is done with water, so you can't beat that. I put the glue in all the mortises and on the tenons. I leave the door in the clamps for a few hours, and then it's time to do the final sanding and shaping. Yeah, baby. I sand the flats first, making sure all the joints are even and smooth. Then I could add the roundover around the perimeter and finesse the inside edges. I then spend a good amount of time making the inside corner profiles meet up elegantly. And now for more finish. Back at the house, I drill for the cup hinges using Rockler's sweet little jig. I actually need three hinges per door, so I have to shift it once to get the job done. With the hinges dropped in and a straight edge across all three, I could pre-drill and drive some screws. Thankfully, I have a lovely assistant willing to help me install the doors. These hinges simply cradle the inside of the face frame, so as long as I locate them where they need to go vertically, I could simply pre-drill and drive the screws. Same drill as last time. Mm -hmm. Drill. <laughs> okay, sorry, I was left that. You're so witty. <laughs> Uh-oh. Nope. That... Too high. That's There's it. a little adjustment range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll oh, tune so, them after. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Right, so okay. that's two. Let me get the third one. Yay! Wow. 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 And now for that final piece of crown, which really sets it off. For the hardware, I'm going with these simple, elegant rectangle doohickeys.
And to help make sure the doors are as quiet as possible and sit nice and parallel with the face frame, I add some little felt buttons. All right, so at this point, I'm gonna say this project is pretty much done. The reason pretty much is because we don't have a top on here and I have yet to do the adjustable shelves, but those will just be simple pieces of plywood with some solid trim. I'm not gonna make a wooden top. We actually have a kitchen remodel coming up soon and the bar has a little piece of granite that I think would be perfect to be recut and placed right on top here. So we're gonna hold off on that. I wish I can kind of like completely call this done, but it's just not the right time. This will work for now and then we'll get that granite top put in there. This is one of the most uh, biggest accomplishments for me. Now, you might think that's nuts given some of the fine woodworking stuff that I've done in the past, but this is an area that I've never really explored. I've never received instruction on how to do built-ins, how to do on-site uh, construction like this, as well as some of the trim carpentry aspects of this. I've got a lot of respect for that work. It's just something I'm not trained in. So the fact that this was for my wife and a thing she really needed and wanted, and then of course tackling an area that was uncomfortable for me makes this one of my favorite projects that I've done in a long time. So I am glad to see it finally done and in use. Now, a project like this, especially one where it's outside of my comfort zone, is bound to have mistakes. We're bound to have lessons learned along the way, and I don't mind sharing those with you. After all, this is all about learning. I'm glad to share that with you, and hopefully it'll stop you from making the same mistake or give you something to think about if you embark on a project like this yourself. All right, so let me go over a couple things I've learned. Now, something I probably would have done differently if I were to do this again is to make the cabinets a little bit more shallow. So I did the math on this, and I looked at how much the average piece of hanging clothes requires front to back and 24 inches was a good number. The problem here is 24 inches is really if you're thinking about putting doors on here. If you're going to close this, yes, you want the cabinet to be in front of the clothing. But in this case where they're exposed like this, you don't really need that. They can hang out a little bit. So I probably could have lost a good four inches on this stuff. It would have made everything lighter, a little bit easier to install. And especially in a tight situation like this, in this closet, it would have made it feel a little bit less closed in. Not a huge deal, but ultimately that's one thing I would do a little bit differently next time. Another thing is down here on the base of this piece, the way that I had to wrap the trim around there, I'm really not happy with the way that turned out. It's fine, it looks okay, but I mismeasured, I don't know if it was a mismeasurement, I think it was more when I sat down with SketchUp and I designed the base and the top and making sure that I dodged the trim over there, um, I just got something wrong. And what I should have probably done, I think it would have looked better if this cabinet was overhanging, kind of like we have an overhang here. We could have brought the base in that way a little bit, and then the cabinet would have just had a nice overhang to it. Now, I'm not sure if we would have wanted to trim anything out over here because you'd have a sharp plywood edge there, but I do think we that would have been a more fun problem to solve than the way that this looks now. Um, but ultimately, again, this is just being nitpicky. I think this looks totally fine, but I do think there are better opportunities with an overhang. Now, I wouldn't call this something that I would do differently because I don't think I would. I think I'd do it exactly as you see it here now, but I want you to think about it in case you confront something similar. There is a different solution to this, and that deals with the height of the cabinets themselves. Uh, if you go a little bit higher with the base here, you bring it up a little bit so that the face frame sits above your baseboards, you might like that look a little bit better. And this way the baseboards can run right under there and have no problem then terminating into the toe kick area. What I did here was basically keeping things as low as possible. I knew I was going to go eight feet up and my wife's not that tall, <laughs> so I wanted to make sure it wasn't that hard for her to get everything that's up there. So the higher I went, the less attractive I felt the function was for her. So I kept it where it is, but it's just something to consider. And especially when you've got a ceiling situation like I have with a little bit of a gap there between the crown and the ceiling, if you wanted to go all the way up, that might be one way to do it, is put the height at the base instead of building up your crown so tall. You could build this up a little bit, uh, and this way you can close that gap and then have your crown run right up to the ceiling if that's what you want to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, this still looks fine, but it's just another option. Now the final thing deals with lighting. If I had the luxury of more time and honestly patience, I would have explored that during the construction phase, but it's really, I mean, it's been already a few months that I've been into this build. The more stuff I add to it, the longer it takes and it's harder for me to get these videos out. So I figured that was one thing other than improving the can lights and then adding an extra receptacle in here, I figured that was enough for now. So if we do add lights, 
we don't have a whole lot in the way of power running around here. There are no outlets on this side. There wasn't anything I could easily tap into. Probably going to have to go through the attic if we're going to add some kind of decorative lighting above the cabinets, which I think would look really, really nice. In fact, I've got some battery powered ones that we'll use to take some beauty shots so we can kind of see what that would look like. Over here, we do have an outlet, so it is possible to get a little LED strip over there, which I think would definitely help here because there's a big old shadow going on in that spot. But if time were not of the essence and I could just kind of go as slow as I wanted to, the lighting would have been something I would have incorporated as I was building it. All right, so with that, I'm ready to get back into the shop with variables that I can control. <laughs> This was definitely a super fun experience. A lot of uh, challenging things that I confronted as I went along. And thank you guys for sitting there and watching me go through it. I know some of you are probably banging your head against the wall because you're seeing me do things you know how to do better. And that's totally fine. Uh, we're all here to learn from each other. So, of course, any of those tips and tricks that you might know, feel free to leave those in the comments. But thanks for watching both of these parts. If you haven't seen the first part, go ahead and watch that because that was fun getting all those pieces in. Uh, and I guess, yeah, thanks for watching everybody appreciate it see you next time so what who cares <laughs> dougie right on the doors dude no way what did you just do that did you just do what i think you did <laughs> oh. <laughs> what <a> <laughs>